them. And no, we're just so glad that you're here. If you came in, you were smart to come today. It's going to be great. Um, just such a wonderful time. Today is uh, just a wonderful day in Jesus. And today is our last Sunday for two service times. So if you're tuning in online at 930, we're going to start next Sunday at 10 o'clock, just so you know that. Uh, next week starts our Lenten season um, sermon series. So say that five times fast. L Lenten season sermon series. Um, and so it's going to be on altars. It's going to be a great sermon series. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be fantastic, just like everything is. My favorite word, fantastic. So it's going to, our next series is going to take us right up to Easter. You're not going to want to miss it. Make sure you're here. Uh, six weeks ago, our church started a, a campaign, 40 Days of Purpose, and we've been reading Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, and it's just been a fantastic journey discovering God's purposes, his five purposes for every person, every person in the world, God has placed five purposes in their lives, and so um, we are down to the wire, we have only five days left of reading, so today is day 36, we only have five days left, and this has just been an awesome journey. I just let me, let me encourage you to finish strong. You can do it. Don't just say, well, I'm a little bit behind, so I'm going to stop. Dig deep, plug on, finish this together. Let's finish this book together and complete. These last five days are really important, so you can do it. You can complete this 40 days. In 40 days, uh, God did a lot of different things in the Bible, and let him finish that work in you, that 40-day life transformation process, and you don't quit now. You're almost there. Awesome. So each week in this series, we've been given a highlight of the week, week coming's reading, and that's what we're going to do today. And so today, we'll be highlighting the last purpose, purpose number five, you were made for a mission. You were made for a mission. So we're building on the premise that there is a God who created everything by design. Nothing by accident. Everything it was created by God's design and that his design was brought about by his great love and thoughtfulness. You are not a haphazard creation. God thoughtfully put you together and knitted you together by his design. And he intended for your life to fulfill the purposes that he placed in you. His, he delights in what he has made and in his kindness, goodness, and love. He's in, put intent and purpose in you, his creation. Last week, we looked at purpose number four. You were shaped for serving God, and he intended all along for us to do something. He has a purpose for us to do something, to serve. We weren't created just to be a bump on the log and do nothing. He's created us to do for work, to do something. And last week, we looked at we were created for serving, and we were shaped for serving. And uh, Rick Warren uses that word shape and makes a, an acronym out of it. Um, it's spiritual gifts, heart, uh, abilities, personality, and experience. Spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personalities, and experience. He uses all that to shape you into service. Now this week, we're going to build on that, on you were made for a mission. So what's the distinction between, between serving in a ministry and serving in a mission? Rick Warren states that your ministry is your service to believers, and your mission is your service to unbelievers. So our ministry is to one another, those who have faith in Jesus Christ. We minister to one another in the body of Christ, and then we have a mission to those who do not yet have faith in in Jesus Christ. So that is the distinction. God's fifth purpose for your life is for you to complete your mission in the world, to serve unbelievers by telling them the good news 
of Jesus Christ. This is such an important thing to tell others about Jesus. How many of you didn't know about Jesus before you knew about Jesus? All of us, right? How many of you needed somebody to tell you about Jesus? Every single person in this room needed somebody to tell them about Jesus. Could you just think of where you would be if nobody told you about Jesus? If nobody explained to you the gospel, what would your life look like? Where would you be this morning? God used somebody to tell you about Jesus. Jesus gave the good news to the disciples, and the disciples gave the good news to other believers, and those believers passed it on to believers who passed it on to believers who passed it on to believers. Fast forward of 2,000 years who passed it on to you, who now we have the incredible privilege of passing it on to somebody else. We, it's like a, a, a wonderful, almost a, a wonderful direct line from Jesus to you. Through the history, through his disciples, Jesus whispers in you, your ear through somebody else, I love you and I have a plan for your life. And we respond to that and we have this wonderful, wonderful thing that we get to do is to share the mission of Jesus Christ. To tell other people about what he has done for us. When we share Jesus with others, we are continuing the work of Jesus. We are partnering with him. He started the work by coming, by living, by dying, by rising again, and we continue his work by spreading the news of what he's done, of spreading the news of how he's changed our life, how he's made a difference in us. There is nobody like Jesus, and there's nobody who can change a life and turn it around like Jesus can. It is by faith we believe the message, and then when faith grabs a hold of our heart, it changes our situation. There's a powerful uppull of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't keep us where we were, where we were down and low in our sin, but it pulls us up out of our tragedy, out of our sin, out of our darkness, and it puts life and light into our hearts. It's an amazing thing what the gospel does. And one of the greatest privileges that we get to do, besides having the gospel affect us, is that we get to watch the gospel affect somebody else. To see the change in their life, to see the perspective change, to see the uphold of the gospel in their lives, to see what God did in you replicated in somebody else. That is our mission. That is what God has called us to. He's purposed, purposed in our lives to see the gospel replicated in somebody else. Praise God. There's nothing better, something powerful about that. The purpose in our life is to make a difference in someone else's life. Here's a quote from the book. If just one person will be in heaven because of you, your life will have made a difference for eternity. If just one person is in heaven because of you, that you've influenced, you have impacted eternity. You are here on earth for for many different reasons, for those five purposes. But this purpose has eternal significance. Worse, you change somebody's destiny from uh, eternity of punishment to an eternity with God. It changes the difference. It makes the difference. This is the goal, to make an eternal difference in someone's life. And God has placed that purpose on you. He's, it's, it's, an, it's a privilege. It's a po- he makes things possible. This message that is in your mouth does incredible things. And so I just want to highlight a couple of points from this week's reading. If you're taking notes today, the first fill-in is God wants to say something to the world through me. On the back of your bulletin, you can follow along. It's at the first point is God wants to say something to the world through me. You have a unique testimony 
and story to tell the world what God has done for you. You, There is no one in history that has the exact story that you do, that your life tells. Nobody has your same background. Nobody has your experience. God has uniquely placed in you a life message, a life message that testifies of the greatness of our God. And this life message helps us fulfill this purpose of fulfilling our mission. So God wants to use your life message to bring people to Jesus. So what's in your life message? Well, there's, there's four things that, are, that help build our life's message. So the first thing, your life message is your testimony. Your testimony, how you came to Christ, what God has done in your life, how he's brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light, your testimony of where you were, your testimony of the great power of God in your life, the testimony that there is no one like Jesus. This is your life message. Nobody can recant what refute, excuse me, nobody can refute what God has done for you. They might try to argue facts and figures and things and and dates, but they cannot refute the miracle of what God has done in your life. Your testimony. There's nothing as ironclad of of a praise to God, of a evidence of Jesus than what he has done in your life. Your life message is built on your testimony, what God has done. Your life message is also your life lessons. The lessons, your life lessons, the things that God has taught you in your life from the things and experiences in your life, things like what you've learned, how God helps you through failure, how God helps you when you don't have any money, when God helps you during your pain, when God helps you during your sorrow, when God helps you during your disappointment times, the life lessons he's taught you during that, life lessons through your family, life lessons through your church. There, no, there is a powerful thing when you can say, well, God taught me through this situation that he always comes through. When you're facing this situation, maybe it's a sickness, maybe it's a, a drought of money, maybe it's this or that, My life lessons, the thing that I've experienced from God is this. When I surrender like this, God does this. You have life lessons that God has placed in you that shapes your message when you tell other people about Jesus. You have ironclad proof of God's goodness through your life lessons. Next, your life message is also built on your godly passions, what God has ignited in your heart, your godly passions, things that he has given you to have compassion for, to advocate for, to have a heart for. Your life message is is your passions and your ministry, what God has, has called you to do. This is part of what God has called you and builds your life message upon is your godly passions. And so, when you're talking to somebody and you can say, you can say your testimony, you can say your life lessons, then you can say, now this is how I make a difference. This is how my life makes a difference. This is how the gospel of Jesus Christ has transformed me. And now I have a godly passion that transforms into real life change. Maybe it's giving, uh, Maybe giving your time at the homeless shelter, or, or maybe it's, it's volunteering at the food bank, or maybe it's this or that. But God will give you, every believer, he will give you a passion to champion, a, a, a thing to have a heart for, to have compassion over. Your life message is also your godly passions. Then lastly, your life message is built upon the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the glad tidings of his coming, the message of Jesus, how he saved you, how he changed you, the, the, the facts that Jesus lived a sinless life. He came, he lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. 
his passion for, for us. He died on the cross. And then proof of his godhood is that he rose again on the third day. This is a part of everybody's story, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This that makes our lives difference. So God, has, he wants to say something to the world through you, through me, and he uses our life message to do that, to bring people to Jesus. Next highlight, if you're taking notes, is the Great Commission is my commission. The Great Commission is my commission. So what is the Great Commission? The, the Great Commission is where Jesus has he's risen from the dead, and this is the last thing that he's telling his disciples. He is commissioning them to carry on his message. He is sending them on to carry his message to the world. He told his disciples to tell people the message locally, regionally, and globally locally, regionally, and globally, to tell people the message of the life-transforming work that he does about his forgiveness and how they can receive eternal life. This transformational message, they were supposed to take it uh, globally, locally, regionally, and globally. And God's plan to save the world was and is for Jesus' followers to tell the message to everyone, everywhere. He didn't have a plan B. He doesn't have angels lined up in heaven just in case you don't do your job. He, his only plan to save the world is for people to transmit the message from, from mouth to mouth, to tell other people. He doesn't have a plan B. You're his plan A, and he, <laughs> and he doesn't have a backup because he knows his power through us can accomplish amazing, amazing things. And so the same commission that he, give, he gave to his disciples 2,000 years ago, he gives to his people today. It says, go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he's commissioned every believer to be a part of taking that message of Jesus everywhere to everyone both locally regionally and globally he wants everybody that claims him as their lord and savior to be a part of this mission this being commissioned to take his gospel how can we be a part of taking this to uh, locally global uh, regionally and globally we do it by praying giving and going. We pray, give, go. This is, we do that locally, regionally, and globally. So here at GTC, we take our commission by Jesus very seriously. We, we want to obey Jesus. We want to follow him. We want him to have an effect on our lives. We want what he wants in our lives, and we want people in DeKalb, in Illinois, in the United States, in the world to know the life-transforming message of Jesus Christ. So as a church, we pray, we give, and we go. We pray, we give, we go. Every Wednesday night in our prayer meeting, the hashtag most important service of the week, don't miss it, uh, we pray for our local ministry, our regional ministries, and our global ministries. We pray for missionaries. We pray for the needs of our local and larger, uh, larger needs. And we pray for God to intervene on our behalf, that God would do something. And we pray for missionaries, and we pray for churches, and we pray for, for ministries. And we pray and because we know that when we pray, it moves the hand of God, and God does amazing things. But now we don't just stop at prayer, but prayer is a part of it. Prayer is something that we have to do and, and ask God to fulfill his promises. And then we, then we give. Uh, we're at, excuse me. 
Next service, when we do our annual report, you will see that our church believes in giving to ministries. You've given to us, and, and we've been a good steward of that, and we've had our own church ministries thrive, and we place money in that, but we also uh, have given 10% of, every, of our income, and we've given, uh, and above that, we've given over $55,000 to ministries um, locally, regionally and globally and if you want to look in the hallway the flag hallway you will see pictures and and uh, certificates of the ministries that we support locally you will see the certificates of the people we support regionally for the united states and you will see the picture certificates of those we support globally we believe in the global local and regional mission of the church and so God is calling us uh, as a church, but also individually to be involved in the mission of the church, to be commissioned. So if you're not giving to missions, let me encourage you to give up and above your tithe to missions, to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. If you have not adopted a country that you weep over and you pray for, let me encourage you to ask God to give you a nation to pray for, to pray for Kosovo or pray for Nepal or pray for Sri Lanka, the Maldives. Pray for a country. Say, God, give me a country that I can pray for, that I will pray and weep over, that you will give me your heart for that people, Lord, for, for Thailand, for Myanmar, God, for Tibet, God, for China, God, for uh, Mongolia, God, for Russia, God, for, for Kyrgyzstan, for Kazakhstan, Lord Jesus, that you would move in Turkey, that God would give you a heart for Georgia, or God would give you a heart for South Africa, or God would give you a heart for Tanzania that you would say, God, your heart, your heart bleeds for the world. Give me your heart. The most important thing to God is souls. The most important thing. It was the most expensive thing that he's ever done, the most extravagant thing he's ever done, the most costly, the most time-consuming thing that God has ever done was to create a salvation plan for humanity, and he wants us to have his heart. Now, it is really easy, for, for me at least, to get excited about four missions, and get excited about people that are overseas and a thousand miles away. But do we still get excited and pray for and weep over the people that are our neighbors, our community, our nation? Do we still have a, we can give money to missions. We can raise money for a well in Africa quicker than you can drop a hat. We can raise money to prevent human trafficking around the world that fast. But do we have compassion for our neighbors? Do we have compassion for the people that we see every day, the people that we drive by, the people that we wave to when we pull out of our driveway, the people that we cut off in traffic or cut us off in traffic? Do we have a heart for people that look like us? Or do we just relegate them to the side and say, well, somebody else will reach them? Friends, God has commissioned us not just globally, but locally to preach the gospel, to share the good news with people in DeKalb County. I've said this many times before, but would it matter if we close the doors to our church? And would it matter to our community if we closed the doors to our church and never opened them again? Would it matter? Would we have an impact that would be missed? Would people miss us if we shut our church down? I hope so. I hope that we pray for our community, that crime is, that the, that the devil is thwarted because of our prayer, because of our intercession for um, our community. I pray that our prayers make a difference. I pray that we're praying. Are we praying for the, for the gangs? Are we praying for the college? Are we praying for the university? Are we praying that God would break through the poverty that's in our area? Are we praying that the gospel would be established in people's hearts? Are we praying that there would be an uphold of the gospel? Are we praying for transformation? Are we living out our commission for our community? God has commissioned us 
along with John the Apostle, Peter, James, all Thaddeus, Bartholomew. He's commissioned us all alongside those people to work for the king. Are we doing our part? Are we weeping? Are we praying over the lost? Saying, God, save the lost in our community. God, save the lost in our nation. Lord Jesus, save the lost who have never heard you before. God, that you would do great and mighty things through our church. Are we doing our part? Friends, let's do our part together. Let's say, God, let's say to Jesus, you've commissioned us. We accept your commission. We accept your calling. We accept what you have for us to do. This is what he calls us to do. What is the calling? Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Follow Jesus. Praise God. That is our, the fifth and final purpose is to live for the mission that he has called us to do. We are made for a mission. He has placed in us a calling. We are made for a mission. Next, if you're taking notes, is blessed are the balanced. Blessed are the balanced, for they shall outlast everyone. Blessed are the balanced. And so this point uh, in the book, this is the, the second to last day, uh, Mr. Warren, Brother Warren, is wrapping up, and he uh, wants us to know that God wants our lives to be balanced in the five purposes that he's given us in our lives. What are the five purposes? They are worship. They are fellowship. They are discipleship, maturing, growing in the Lord, ministering or serving one another, and evangelism, our, this, living out our missions, our mission. Most Christians that gravitate to one or two of these purposes and they live, leave the other others behind and they just focus on what makes them comfortable or what is comes natural but God has placed all five purposes all five on our lives and he wants us to live them out it's God's design that you live a life of worship but worship is not the only purpose God is designed for you to live a life of fellowship with believers. It's a wonderful thing. But that's not the only purpose. God is designed for you to mature in Christ, to know him, to know the depth and height of the love of God for you. But that's not the only purpose. If we only had head knowledge and we never gave out the love of God, there would be no reason to be mature. He wants us to be mature, but that's not the only purpose. He's purposed in us ministry to serve one another, to serve the body of Christ. He's shaped us for service. He shaped us to love one another, to serve one another. But that's not the only purpose. And purpose number five is evangelism. Even evangelism is not the only purpose. It's a wonderful thing. But if you only do evangelism, where's the fellowship? Where's the worship? Where's the maturing in Christ? There must be a balance in our lives that we see that, God, that we are living out your purpose. So how do we know if we're leaving one of these, these areas out of our lives? Well, from time to time, we need to take time and evaluate, self-evaluate. We need to do this on a regular basis to sit down and say, Am I worshiping? Am I worshiping? Am I, do I have adequate fellowship in my life? Am I spending time with other believers? Am I, I allowing other people, other believers to speak into my life? Am I making this a priority? Am I growing in Christ? Or am I the same, the same spot I was last year? Have I matured in Christ? Do I still lose my temper as quickly or have I matured in that area or whatever deficit 
that you have. I say, are you growing in that area? Is, are you allowing God to speak to you? Are you allowing God to change you, to create you like Christ? Then evaluate, are, am I ministering? Do I have a ministry? Am I serving? Or am I just letting others serve me? Am I content with other people just serve me? There's a statistic that, that uh, is true in most churches uh, that 20% of the congregation does 80% of the work. Friends, that is not the design that God wants for his church because if everybody had a ministry that did their ministry, that 100% of the people would do 100% of the work and distribute that out. God has designed you to serve. So sit down and say, am I doing my part? Am I pulling my weight in God's church? Am I serving? And then, this is probably the hard, hardest one, is sit down and say, am I telling my story to other people? Do people around me know what God has done for me? Maybe they don't want to hear it. That's fine. But do they know my story? Do they know what, have I given God credit? Am I telling people, am I being evangelistic enough? Am I telling people my story? Am I supporting missions? Am I supporting work and ministry locally, regionally, and globally? Am I telling my story to other people? So we have to self-evaluate on a regular basis so that we can have a balanced and fulfilled life. What happens if we leave one of these out? We, will, we won't have the satisfaction that God intended us to have. We, we won't be as successful as believers. There'll still be successes, and there'll still be wonderful things happening. But, friends, I want you to know that God has more for you. This, this whole experiment of 40 days of purpose is God has more for us. He has more for us to do. There's more in Jesus that we haven't discovered yet. There's more in the relationships in our churches that we haven't discovered yet. There's more things. There's more service. There's more gifts. There's more callings that we aren't living out. So let's allow God to work in us and respond to him and allow his purposes in our lives. And that leads us to the last point. Lastly, if you're taking notes, is living with purpose is the only way to live. Living with purpose is the only way to live. In order to live a fulfilled life, we just need to say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender to your purpose. I want your purpose in my life. I want what you have for me, God. I, I want to lay aside my plans, my wishes, my selfish desires, and Lord, I just want what you have for me. I want what you want for me. So to find out God's purposes, we just, we just ask five questions. What will be the center of my life? What's the worship of my life? What is the center of my life? Is God at the center of my life? Or is something else? Is, is success, money, the center of my life is sports or, or my children or other things. Are they the center of my life? The next question is, what will be the character of my life? Well, what will I be known for? Will I allow Christ to mature me, to grow in Christ, to be discipled? What will be the character of my life? What, then the next question is, what will be the contribution of my life. What will I add? Will I just take away? Or what is the contribution that I will give to God's church? What is my contribution? The next is, what will be my communication? What will be the communication of my life? Do I communicate to people of the world that, yeah, you don't really need Jesus? Is that the communication that I'm sending? Or is the communication of my life saying, Jesus is so wonderful. He's so good. You can't live without him. He's amazing. What is the communication of your life? And lastly, what will be the community of your life? Who you're going to surround yourself with? You're going to surround yourself with God's people? 
Or you're going to surround yourself with other things, that people that drag you down, that distract you, that lead you astray. Friend, God has designed and purposed your life. Let's live it out the way he designed it. And you will never be more fulfilled than when you're living out God's purpose for your life. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Praise God. As you read this week, as you finish reading, let God speak to you. Let God motivate you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the last 40 days where we got to experience you. And Lord, we have five more days left. Lord, I just pray that we would allow you to speak to us. And not just to speak to us, but you would motivate us for your heart. Lord, you love everybody. There's not a person that you've created that you do not love. God, I pray that you would give us your heart. Give us your heart for the lost. Give us your heart for our community. Give us your heart for our nation and for the world. Jesus, I pray that you would break our hearts for the lost. Lord, we know so many lost people that sometimes we just get complacent and we just live our lives and we forget the powerful message that we have. We forget the powerful, life-transforming message of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would remind us and that forever we would be, a, we would be cognizant of what we have and that people need you, that people need Jesus, that people need forgiveness, that people need the love of God, and that love of God comes from me. Lord, I don't want to leave the mission to my brother, my sister. I pray that they take a mission, but God, I don't want to leave it to them. I want to fulfill your mission in my life, to fulfill the purposes that you have for my life. God, we want to pray this way. God, give us souls. God, give us people that need you. God, that you would work in our church, that you would help us, God. Help us, God, help in our shortcomings. God, help us when we don't know what we're doing. God, help us, Lord. We know that you will. With their heads still bowed and eyes closed, you're here. And you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to say yes to Jesus. Maybe you said yes in the past, but you're not living for him now. Maybe you've never said yes to Jesus. But you need a relationship with Jesus, and you need to become a follower of Jesus. If that's you this morning, would you just confess that by raising your hand and say, yeah, that's me. I need Jesus. I need to be a follower of Jesus. For the first time, or rededicating. Waiting just for a moment. I see your hand. You can put your hand down. Waiting just for a moment. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that your purposes are worked out in our lives. God, you saw the hands that were raised. God, I pray. I pray for those who need to rededicate their lives to you, those who need to just confess you, Jesus, that they would confess you as their Lord and their Savior and believe in their heart that you raised, that God, you raised Jesus from the dead. For the Bible says, with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. Lord, and with the heart, we believe. And God, I just pray that you would work your salvation in their heart.